Veronica Ivey. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, I'm gonna say from the top, because I've noticed this happens in every conversation. Every time you bring up trans rights, or if you have a discussion and you say trans, people tense up. I understand why. We live in a world where now there are people who are so transphobic that it makes it almost impossible for people who aren't to ask any questions, to have any conversations, to have any discourse that doesn't lump them in with transphobia. And so I, I'm, I'm really glad that you're joining us on the show to talk about this because it feels like one of the biggest issues in America yeah. and yet no one can seem to talk about it. So let's start with your journey. Um, you've competed at some of the highest levels yeah. uh, in sports. And you know, as your hoodie says, sport is a human right. That, that, is, yeah. that is what you believe in. Talk me through. me through just a little bit of, of, of why you believe fighting for transgender athletes to compete in the categories they'd like to in sport is so important. So it's a fundamental tenet of like the Olympic movement that sport is a human right. So in their Olympic charter, in their fourth fundamental principle of Olympism, they say participation in sport is a human right. And they mean that at the competitive level. Mm -hmm. So th this issue, people like to say that it's a complicated issue and I don't actually think it is. I think it's very simple. It all boils down to, do you actually think that trans women and intersex women are real women and are really female mm -hmm. or not? And if you do, it's very simple. Just stop policing who counts as a real woman because this has had history of racism built into it over the years. It's not an accident that the intersex athletes who get singled out are women of color from the global south because who gets singled out for scrutiny is based on white women's conceptions of femininity. And that's being weaponized against trans people too. So it's a fear of protecting the fragile, weak, cis, white woman from the rest of us. So, so <laughs> there are many elements to what you said, which I appreciate. So let, let's try to break them down. One thing that confuses me personally is it, it, it seems like we have discussions about who should participate in which category and how. You know, on the face of it, it seems simple as you say. You know, if somebody identifies as a woman, if they're transgender, they can compete against women who were born biologically, and, and then if not, then not. But then there are many who would argue who are not transphobes. There are many who, who are born biologically women who will say, but you have an unnatural advantage over me and that makes the sport unfair. How do, you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, there's lots of ways you can respond to that. So the first is the, the very language of you were born and I'm not biological somehow, like I don't think I'm a cyborg. So like this idea that like, oh, you're not a biological woman. Well, I am a woman, that's a fact. I am female, so all my identity records, my racing license, my medical records all say female, mm -hmm. right? And I'm pretty sure I made a biological stop. So I'm a biological female mm -hmm. as well. So this question of do trans women have an advantage over cis women? We don't know. Um, in fact, there's basically no published research on this question. However, uh, there's good reason to think that there isn't, but I think it's irrelevant because we That's allow all kinds of competitive advantages within women's sport. So one example I love to talk about is the 2016 Rio Olympic women's high jump final. First place was over six foot three, tenth place was five foot five. So a 10 and a half inch height difference between first and 10th at the Olympics okay. in high jump. Right. And we call that fair. Okay. So the range of body types within the female category is way, way bigger than anything that could be attributed to trans women. Uh -huh. So if there's an advantage, and I'm not saying that there is for trans women in women's sport, it's not an unfair advantage. But also, we've been competing, at, trying to compete at the highest level for decades. We've been allowed to compete for decades. And no one has won an elite world championship no one has won an Olympic gold medal. This Tokyo Olympics was the first time trans women even qualified for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So this idea that trans women are suddenly gonna take over women's sport is an irrational fear of trans women, which is the dictionary definition of transphobia. So uh, it's interesting that you say that, you know, because... It's interesting that you say that because 
I think if, if I were to push back or, you know, even not even playing devil's advocates, uh, there, were, there are a few things that could be argued. Number one, you could argue that although the trans woman who competed in the Olympics didn't dominate, she did beat a field of women who might have qualified for that position, right? Um, secondly, when you talk about the height differences, I, I agree with this completely, but there, there are many who would argue that we exist in a state where a lot of the surgeries are new, a lot of the technology, just the technology is new. Transgenderism is not new. We know it throughout time, we've seen it throughout history. But there are many who would say, how do we ensure that we are creating some sort of standard? And the reason, the reason we talk to this, is, you know, we talk about this is, it's the reason they have to regulate, uh, regulate uh, performance enhancing drugs, for instance. What is fair, what can you drink, what can you not drink, what can you consume, what can you not consume? Um, some would say, if you are born that way, that's how sport has determined who goes where. And then some would say, no, who, regardless of who you are, you should be able to compete. My question then comes in from a really, honestly, a different place. I look at somebody like Oscar Pistorius from South Africa, right? He was the double amputee. Yep. And Oscar Pistorius actually went, well, I want to compete in the able-bodied race, mm -hmm. right? And people were like, well, do you have an advantage? Do you not, et cetera, et cetera, because of the prosthetics. But then could there not be an argument if there is no advantage in that, that then trans women should be able to compete but in the men's races then, because they'd still be able to compete in the sport? But they're women and they're female. So like I said, this boils down to are trans women really women? Are they really female? Because if you think yes, then we belong competing with other women. So it's an extreme indignity to say, I believe you're a woman except for sport. Right? So mm -hmm. you can't single out one of the most important facets of our society. We are obsessed with sport. Athletes are some of the most highly praised, highly paid people on the planet. Definitely. Definitely. So you can't say that, like, I believe you and I support you, but not for this one really big thing that society really cares about. Right. And I'm, 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 I'm saying I get confused by why we distill it down into just two things. I'll tell you why. As we learn about gender being a spectrum, as we learn that people can identify in, in a multitude of ways, we accept the fact that we don't have to put people into categories of man or woman. You know, we, that's why they say protect trans women. It's like, otherwise, which women are you protecting? It's, 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 it's an argument that doesn't separate or diminish anybody, but gives more specificity to what people are saying. And so when we talk about these things, I sometimes get confused by why we're trying to force the people into two again, when we've been taught that there isn't a two, whereas, a sport like, let's say boxing, for instance. In boxing, people fight across all weight categories. Mm -hmm. They don't just go men's boxing, women's boxing. They go, no, men, heavyweight, super heavyweight, and then they'll be like middleweight, bantamweight, flyweight, featherweight. There's like guys who weigh nothing punching each other. <laughs> and, and I mean this genuinely, I've always thought to myself, it's interesting how in boxing they went, well, we don't just want to see guys fighting. We want to see guys fighting at different weights. The UFC does the same thing. They go, you, you're going to fight in your weight class, which has, it seems crazy, how can you break it down, and yet it's worked. And so I wonder if you've ever considered, and I'm not saying it's your job, by the way, but if you've ever considered a world- It kind of literally is. Oh, then great. <laughs> Have you ever considered a world where it becomes more specific then? You know, the same thing they did in the Paralympics. They, they had to find a way where they classified how a single amputee could run against somebody who's partially blind or a double amputee, and how do, how do we grade that? So, do you not think that we're limiting ourselves by saying men's sports, women's sports, when we now know that there are so many more genders? So I'm really going to dissatisfy you right now. Um, well, you don't know what I'm looking for, though, so you can't. I do. <laughs> I, I know you're looking for something other than what I'm going to say, and that that is a very important question uh -huh. and a very difficult question, but it's a separate question. The question we're talking about is, given how sport is currently structured, mm -hmm should we include trans women and intersex women in women's sport? And my answer to that is a clear yes. If you want to say, should we revisit how we structure all of sport, I would say, yeah, we should do that. But if your only reason for doing that is because you can't just accept trans women or women, that's a problem I got with you. I understand, and I'm not saying it's not because with people you can't. No, no, I hear what you're saying. No, I, com I, completely, I completely hear what you're saying. So let me ask you this then, you know, Again, eliminating fringes, because everything on the internet becomes fringe. Everything becomes a fight and an argument. If somebody comes to you in good faith, and I mean genuinely good faith, and they say to you, you know, Veronica, 
I was born a woman, raised a woman. I, I, I've, I've suffered or, or lived and experienced life as a woman. This is where I am. This is where my body has gotten me to. I've grown as a woman. My body has had the testosterone or estrogen that it had to get me to this point, and that's why I am here. And I feel like you may or may not have the advantage, but we don't know yet. So why can't we wait to know these things before you compete against me? How would you respond to that? Because that's not how human rights work. So the way human rights work is that the default is inclusion and the burden of proof is on the people seeking to exclude, not the people seeking to include. So I want to share something shocking with everybody. Uh, it wasn't until five years ago that we actually studied the relationship between natural testosterone and performance. And we found that there is no relationship whatsoever between unaltered, natural, endogenous testosterone and sport performance. About 0.5% of elite male track and field athletes at the world championship level are below the women's average of testosterone. Competing with men with 80 to 100 times as much testosterone at no competitive disadvantage. And that fact has not been picked up by the broader media landscape. So when you say, I'm a woman and I have this much testosterone, well, first, there's a huge range within women. Definitely. Into the male range. And there is no relationship between her having a competitive advantage over women with lower testosterone. So there are elite cis men with low testosterone, lower than a given woman, who's out competing her. Mm -hmm. So our bodies and biology is not this simple. We thought it was, and it isn't. So we know that when you add testosterone to your natural levels, like doping, you tend to get bigger, stronger, faster. We also know that when you drop your testosterone levels, like trans women tend to do, mm -hmm. you tend to get slower. But what your natural level is has no relationship to your sport performance. And we've been singling out that factor, testosterone, against the scientific evidence. But I, I'm a little confused, and forgive me if I'm slow to understand this. You just said the natural level doesn't give you an advantage or a disadvantage. But you said if people do have an addition or a subtraction of it, then it does give you a disadvantage or an advantage. Well, it, it affects things. So for example, like my body doesn't produce testosterone, and it hasn't for a decade. But I switched sports from a road cycling event to a, a track power event, mm -hmm. and I switched training. And I put on 25 pounds of muscle, and I went from being able to squat 170 to 375. So I don't produce any testosterone, and I squat a lot. And that's just because I changed training. Mm -hmm. So it's not so simple as, OK, if you drop your testosterone, you will get weaker. Because if you change your training, your diet, your rest and recovery, your sport, your performance can change. Your body will change. It seems like we're always going to end up in a cul-de-sac because many people use it as a cudgel, I've realized, to scare people. Oh, the transgenders are coming for you, your bathrooms, your sports, oh, we are. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you say. Um, but. But it feels like there are many discussions to be had. It feels like, as you said, you know, the, the, the research, the science, the everything hasn't caught up. But I, I appreciate you for coming on the show and discussing this with us. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah.